but I'm going to be talking about uh, a very different space that's in South London. And um, I work as the curator and director of a, the home of the conceptual artist John Latham. Uh, it's called Flat Time House. And this is the, the actual home where he lived from 1985 until his death in 2006. So John Latham was born in 1928 in Maramba in Zambia, or what was then called Livingston in northern Rhodesia. And when he was living in Peckham, he would make his work in this space, he lived there, and he would invite his friends over and he would talk about art and serious issues. Um, in 2003, this space ceased to, to be known as 210 Belden Road, and he named it Flat Time House. And he designated it a conceptual artwork, and he named the different spaces after different parts of the body. He anthropomorphized the space and called it a living sculpture. You can see the mind, brain, body event, and hand. So outside of the house, the most uh, startling, unusual aspect is a large book sculpture that protrudes, is cantilevered through the front of the building. You can see there it's supported by the pane of glass. And then the first room that you enter is called the mind. As you progress through, you come to an office space. This is the space that I work in, and it also houses the John Latham archive. You go into the corridor, which, in which you spray painted onto the walls the shift. And then you get to the, the body event. This is a kitchen and a living area. And there's an upstairs, which is a bedroom and a bathroom. It's the space where someone lives. In the back was where John Latham used to use his studio. And this is the room that he called the hand. So, uh, oh yeah, and of course, we have studios at the back in the garden area. Um, but the, the space didn't always look like this. This, this is the, 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 the hand in 2005, when John Latham still lived there. This is the body event. You can see it's kind of a tip. And uh, this is one of his working areas in the shift. And you can see it's a real artist studio. It's a, it's a living, working space. Um, but due to John Latham's thinking of time and the way that he approached heritage, it's actually conceptually important towards his legacy that we don't actually keep it as a time capsule, that it's not kept as a space for um, the preservation of the space as it was when he lived there, but rather it's a museum of his ideas and this complex notion uh, which he called flat time towards the end of his life. In 2003, when the sculpture was installed, the, the mind, as he called it, became a space where he would invite people in. And people came from all over the world. So he was in correspondence with scientific figures such as uh, Stephen Hawking, economists and philosophers like Noam Chomsky, musicians and artists. He was in close contact with John Lennon, Yoko Ono, or the Fluxus. Um, and so he was really working in a lot of different fields and knew a lot of different uh, figures because he wasn't really interested in art as separate from society. <coughs> he was interested in um, how art is positioned within society. And he opened this space up and he would sit in this little camp chair and for the last three years of his life he would talk about this concept that he called flat time. It became a kind of pseudo-museum. And towards this he selected four pieces of work from throughout his career which he used almost as diagrammatic tools to, to, to describe flat time. And I keep on saying this word and go, go try and get there and, and explain it. But he, his work has often confused and befuddled many people. People find it difficult. And it's because, partly because um, he has worked in so many fields. He made sculpture and painting, installation, assemblage, uh, land art, found art, conceptual art, instruction works. He did poetry. He did plays, performance. Um, he even did uh, an engineering project with the attempt of capturing, capturing energy from wave tidal energy. So he was really working in lots of different fields. But the first room in the space, and we often keep it as it was with these four works, it sometimes changes. 
was used to kind of talk about this, this notion of how we understood this cosmology. So I'm going to try to do something similar, but it has the caveat that John Latham would almost certainly disagree with how I'm presenting this. Um, it's an intuitive idea, and so inherently by rationalizing it, I'm contradicting the whole notion of flat time. Um, and also, if John Latham was still alive, he would have developed these ideas, and they would have changed by this point. In John Latham's ideas, nothing is static. So this first work is called Proto-Universe. And what you have here is a sheet of glass on the left and a white plane on the right. John Latham uses materials symbolically, and glass he started using in the late 80s, in 1987. These are, this is a fish tank work, and this is one of his works from the 90s, from the God is Great series. And this work he made for this purpose of talking about his understanding of the universe. The sheet of glass is used symbolically to represent nothing, literally nothing, no time, no matter. But also, to make this more complex slightly, the atemporal. The white plane he used to represent what he referred to as the least event. This is the shortest duration that there can be. So this feels like a theoretical concept. Uh, there can always be a shorter duration, but there is an actual um, unit of time, which is the shortest unit of time in which general relativity operates. This is the duration that it takes for a beam of light to cross the diameter of an electron in a vacuum, and it's called a Planck time. Any duration below this, you, you get into the realm of quantum physics, and suddenly things can be in two places at once and can transport from the future to the past. If, if you're operating over the duration of a Planck time, then you're in the realm of general relativity, and things operate how humans relatively re re understand the world, um, the subjective human view. Um, so, so what we have is a movement from nothing to a very small something. And John Latham ascribed to a model of the universe which um, isn't, isn't really popular now, but in the 80s and 90s was very popular, and this was the big crunch theory, in which from a big bang, the universe expands and expands and expands, it reaches a point of maximum extent, and then begins to contract. So rather than a universe, one universe, going from a big bang and extending, what you have rather is cyclical universes and infinite sequences of universes. So with this understanding of the universe, what you have with nothing is transformed, it changes. Rather than this nothing before a big bang, what you actually have is a non-dimensional point, a point of transition from one universe to the next universe. Does this sort of make sense? <laughs> it doesn't matter if you're not totally getting it. Um, a lot of artists in John Latham, they, they, they would say like he was the most influential, fascinating, fascinating artist, but I've got no idea what he's talking about. Um, so, so what you have with this transition point from one universe to the next, this is something that exists in the history of the universe, but John Latham thought this, this shift was something that also existed within other realms of human understanding. So in the history of science, the Big Bang, uh, in the history of science, he thought the writing of the theory of relativity by Einstein was a paradigm shift. And in the history of art, he thought Robert Rauschenberg's white monochromes in 1951 was a paradigm shift, and he saw a relationship between the, the black hole and Robert Rauschenberg and John Cage emerging in the middle of the 20th century. And for John Latham himself, he thought there was a paradigm shift that took place in 1954. Um, and this was when he was living in Hampshire, and he was working with two fascinating people, Clive Gregory and Anita Cozen. And Clive Gregory was an astronomer and um, the director of the London Observatory. Anita Cozen was a parapsychologist and animal behavioralist. 
and together they came up with a unifying theory of the universe that they called psychophysical cosmology. And they created a journal called The O Structure, and they invited John Latham to be involved in this new organization that they called the Institute for the Study of Mental Images. So this paradigm shift for John Latham occurred when he was involved in discussion with them. And he, he was fascinated by this idea of a universe that was understood according to time than, than according to objects and things, an event-based structure of the universe. And at Halloween in 1954, he had been doing work on the house using a spray gun. And when he was asked to do a mural for their Halloween party, rather than painting it in his style that he had always done, he instead used this spray gun that he'd been using around the house, and he made his first um, spray work. Uh, this is a different work from 1954 um, that gives you a sense. Uh, formation. And so this work that we have at Flat Time House is one of his, what he called, one second drawings, a point of spray. And you can think of this as an event. You can think of this as a least event, like the White Plain. And what you have when you look closer is something that could be aesthetically, it could be the smallest particle in the universe, it could be the entirety of the universe, many galaxies in negative, or it could be a human cell under a microscope. And so what he wanted to do was conflate these different aspects of the universe together in one almost, almost um, this tiny gesture, this tiny event. The next work that you get, the third work in the series, introduces a different symbolic aspect of John Latham's work, and this is the book. Uh, he called this work the Book Relief Triad uh, from 2003, uh, reconfigured from 1959. And what you have here is a book that looks partially destroyed, one kind of emerging from the canvas, and one that's completely blank. So these assemblage works he had been making in the 1950s, um, and he, he worked with them in different ways, partially destroying, cutting them, uh, using paste to assemble them together. And he would change them, you know, actively change them all the time. There's a really uh, interesting story by this artist, John Stazecker. He said when he was young, he went to the Tate and he saw this work by John Latham. Uh, this work, film star, it's still in their collection. It's on show at the moment. And he said, it's a different color. And he, he went to the, the desk and, and, and asked, how come this work is a different color to when I came in before? And the person at the desk went, got the curator, the curator came down and explained that sometimes the artists like to come into the space and change the pages of the book and change the colour of the work. And uh, they, the, the, the Latham family still do this to reflect the different spaces that they're in. But the book for John Latham isn't just an aesthetic tool, it's also a symbolic object, like all materials are in his work. And it's symbolic of something he called received opinion. You can call it this, you can imagine this as being knowledge, human knowledge or hierarchical forms of knowledge. There's a quote here um, from his time working as a tutor, uh, senior academic institutions have been defrauding the public and students for 300 years. They are not concerned with education, still left with less with the truth. They are run for the benefit of the staff. So he was quite a radical. And this is one of his radical gestures that he made in 1966. And this is a work that's in the MoMA collection in New York called Art and Culture Spit and Chew. And what he did, did was when he was working at uh, Central St. Martin's, he got his students, uh, who had been given the text by Clement Greenberg, the art and culture. This was essentially how you made artwork. And this is the home of Anthony Caro. And he got his students to take this and eat it. So the students ate the pages of the book. He got, he got them to spit it out into a big vial, and he collected all the spit, added enzymes to it, and distilled it and refined it into a pure art and culture. Um, and he then returned it to the library, and the myth is that he got fired as a result. I think his contract just came to an end. Um, and simul simultaneously, 
he was doing these other radical gestures. This is one of his Scoob Tower ceremonies, where he would take copies of the Encyclopedia Britannica, interleave the pages together till they became blocks, stack them, and then set them on fire. So this, in the aftermath of World War II, in the aftermath of the, 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 the book burning by the Nazis, is an incredibly contentious act, but can be understood as a rejection of all of human knowledge that got us to the point that led to this. What John Latham is doing with these actions with books is saying, don't accept what you've been told, essentially. Don't just accept the received opinion that you, you grow up within. So with the book sculpture at Flat Time House, what you can see is that the two books, the pages have been interleaved together. And symbolically, what he's doing with this is, is rejecting any possible way of opening a book and accessing it and being able to read it in a narrative manner. You need to approach this in an intuitive manner. So to return to the book relief triad, what you have is three books in different configurations, one blank, two books rather, and these reflect different durations for John Latham. And we're getting back to time again. And different states of human understanding or ways in which humans interact with the world. They're named after three characters in Dostoevsky's The Brothers Karamazov. Mitya, Ivan and Alyosha. Mitya, the elder brother, was very, very short-tempered. He was very instinctive with his behaviour. Ivan was very rational, and the younger brother, Alyosha, was very intuitive. So, for John Latham, rather than there being a left-right of politics, he was interested in what determines human, humans living in society. And it is, for him, instinctive actions, eating, sleeping, drinking, excreting, procreation to keep the species going, all the things that humans need to live and to keep the species going. Then there's rational thought. This is being able to communicate as I am now. Hopefully, understand, you can understand what I'm saying, more or less. Um, and, and this is administration, bureaucracy. This is in a much longer duration for John Latham, not the short time frame of about a day, but this is a generation. This is about 30 years. And then what he thought was neglected in society was what he called reflective, intuitive thought. And he thought that this was a much longer duration. And he thought that artists were somewhat capable of thinking in these longer terms. He didn't actually use the word artist. He used a term called incidental person. He didn't think this mode of thought was solely the, the domain of artists. But he thought that artists were particularly capable of this type of thought, of being able to think in such long modes of, uh, of, of, of such long durations. So, this brings me to the fourth work in, in this space, in the mind of Flat Time House. And this is one of John's roller paintings. This is the one from 1987. So these works were initially, he, he, he just had to store his work somewhere and they were rolled up all over the house. And then he started putting them on the windows as blinds. And he quite liked the fact that people saw them outside and uh, people in the house couldn't see them. And then he got fascinated by this bit at the top where you could see a bit of the front of the canvas. And he started activating them so that they could move. Um, this is his 1972 roller that's in the tape collection. And you can see when the canvas moves up, what's on the surface of the canvas changes. And in that process of moving, you're only getting a tiny moment of the present. And so this is conveying passing time, the fact that time is always moving. And this is one mode of time that the roller work oops, conveys. But this, he, he called it a score for the universe. And he said that this actually conveyed three modes of time. There is passing time, whereby these points of spray move and change as we can understand the present. There is also the atemporal. This is the same as the glass sheet. And time base. And the time base is across 
the front of the canvas, these letters that you see here. So at point A, this is the same as a Planck time. This is the shortest duration that there can be according to general relativity. To the left of that is the barrel of the, of the canvas. This is the atemporal. It's ever present throughout, and yet it's outside of time. As you move along to the right, exponentially durations increase to you reach point M. Point M is the shortest duration perceivable to a human. So you can think of this as uh, like a film frame, 1 24th of a second. Once you go shorter than that, longer durations, you see each individual frame. If you go faster, it's constant movement. So this is a duration at the boundary of human experience. To the left of them is the atomic. As you move right across the time base, you get to these three points, P, Q, and R. P corresponds to this instinctive mode of human understanding, uh, eating, sleeping, etc. Point Q is rational understanding, this longer duration of about 30 years. Point R is reflective, intuitive thought, this much longer duration. As you move to the right, you have STU, which he designated as being where what humans consider to be truth is held. And he put art at RST as a bridge between human understanding and what people know of as truth. At U, this is the duration that the universe has been in existence. That's the, the length of time since the Big Bang. And then off the edge of the canvas to the right, point Z, and that's the duration of all possible universes. So what you have with Flat Time House, he considered as a kind of summation of these ideas. With the book sculpture, you have a symbol of the entirety of human knowledge. And it's transitioning from wider society outside, through this plane, through this paradigm shift, state naught, into the space of the mind, the space of reflective intuitive thought. But the reflective intuitive thought wouldn't be able to exist within someone without the rational thought behind it, the office. And then this is dependent on that human being alive, so through the shift, into the body event. And so, as a result of this, Flat Time House needs to be activated. It needs to be lived in. So artists live in the house. And it needs to be a studio space, and artists need to work from there. We need to produce new work. It needs to be intuitive. It needs to be a space for administration, the brain. And it needs to be a space for reflective, intuitive thought. It needs to be able to communicate these complex ideas through um, our exhibition program and our various other aspects. So we do a, a journal of his thought, publications, education programming, screening and events. But what's interesting is that the, the exhibition space that we use changes for every show that we do. So this is Mark Kamishamovitz. This is Lena Hermsdorf, who installed a large reinforced sheet of glass and changed the whole space into a sound installation. And this is the most recent show that just finished this weekend of Ben Payne's work. So, yeah, well, thank you very much. Thank you.